Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Good Thinking Live. For those of you new, uh, this is a show that allows you to have just a little bit of time each week to devote to how to think, meaning with all the time that we are told what to think, this is a little bit of time for you to devote to improving how to think, not how to think, but improving how we think. And those of you who are uh, regulars on the show, I welcome you. I welcome your comments. Let me know that you're here. Let me know where you're from and certainly participate because this is a participation show. I'm going to make a few little changes so that I can see your comments. Let's see what we've got here. I'm going to tip to comments here so I can see all of your comments. Yes, let me know who's here. Where are you from? Today's show is going to be a little different because we're going to focus on some what to do's and then on some how to thinks. And this show is completely focused on deep fakes. And deep fakes, you might have been hearing a lot about deep fakes in the media, but deep fakes are here. And it is going to be incredibly important to know how we can uh, get our brains prepared for being less susceptible to being fooled by deep fakes. Anyway, now I'm going to give some definitions, but first imagine you are home and you get a call from someone that you know, maybe at the bank. Maybe it's a teller that you've known. Maybe it's your banker or your financial advisor. You know them very well. And they say, hey, Becky, hey, whomever, this uh, you've had some fraudulent activity on your account. You recognize the name, you recognize the voice, and they give you some instructions for closing out one account and maybe opening up another, or maybe even transferring some funds from one account to the next. Maybe even it's a video chat. Maybe they even confirm it over some kind of video conferencing. How do you know if that person is real? I remember uh, many, many years back, this like ages me, but the first time I saw an image that was altered by Photoshop, it was my husband gave me this picture of this guy in a tie and it looked like he was like putting his head up his hind side. And I was like, how did he do that? I had never seen a Photoshopped image before. Now you would just see that and say, that's impossible. That's Photoshopped. But how many times do we see Photoshopped images that we don't recognize as being fake? Now, a Photoshopped image is not a deep fake. A Photoshopped image is a shallow fake. And here's the distinct distinction. A shallow fake is an image that has been manipulated by some person, you know, using some kind of editing tool like Photoshop. A deep fake is something different. A deep fake is a synthetic piece of media. Could be some audio, an audio file, could be a video clip, could be an entire movie that is a simulation created by a machine learning out or algorithmic uh, uh, entity. So the machine learning learns about the characteristics of my face, for example, and then produces a simulation of me communicating to you. Maybe this whole good thinking episode is a simulation. All right, so my question is, who are you? Who's here? Where are you from? And then I've got a couple of questions for you before we dive into how you can, some tips and tricks for how you can make yourself less susceptible to being fooled by deep fakes. All right, I'm going to say hi to some people. Let me look on my phone. So otherwise, I have to get so close to the camera that it's annoying. But I'm going to look on my phone to see who's here. And um, then we can start looking at your comments and see who is I'm not showing on my phone. So sometimes it doesn't show on my phone, so I have to get close here. We've got Raj, Raj good evening. Uh, let's see, from Nepal. Fantastic. We've got Stephen from Soccer City, USA. Thank you for being here on the Good Thinking Show. I'm going to shorten your name. You may not go by Raj. I'm sorry if you don't. It's just that for me to look on the camera and see and pronounce is like too much for my poor little, my poor little tired brain. Anyway, welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. 
And here's my question for you. What sense do you rely on most? And I suppose to a certain extent, it, 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 it depends on the context, but think about where you spend the vast majority of your time. Do you spend more time in front of a screen or more time outside or more time in crowds, more time in nature? Depending on where you spend the most time, what sense do you rely on most? And um, how do you use that sense or use your other senses to know what to believe? What is your process for determining what you believe? That's question number one. So if you tell me I use my, my sense of smell most or I use my sense of sight most or my sense of hearing most, that's a good starting point for how you can start to kind of think about that sense, your senses, and how you might be able to avoid or minimize the number of the amount of time you're fooled by deep fakes. All right. Now, shallow fakes, you know, we can be fooled by shallow fakes too, but they are less um, convincing because they tend not to be video image, images that look exactly like the person or audio files that sound exactly like the person. And there are ways that uh, machine learning algorithms and then people who use these machine learning algorithms for influencing you or manipulating you there are ways that just simple mental tools that you can use to block some of that manipulation. And we'll get there in just a minute. Now, I want to recommend the new, brand new LinkedIn learning course called Understanding the Impacts, the Impact of Deep Fake Videos. It's a great primer on some of the stuff we're talking about. What and some of the and some of the some of the great uh, you, uh, benefits of deep fake technology because it's not all bad but if you intend to share videos and photos and audio clips if you intend to use these this media use media to inform your decisions or to allow you to decide who to vote for or what company to invest in or anything where you are using media that you see it is very good to understand to look out for deep fakes, what you can do, and how you can get your good thinking uh, armor on. Now, I wanna also say that um, before we get started, uh, I wanna make sure that we understand the difference between skepticism and cynicism, because one of the two requirements for critical thinking is reflective skepticism. Cynicism is where you think, you go into everything with this negative attitude, thinking that everything is bad, everyone's out to get you, nothing's good, there's no hope, that's cynicism. Skepticism is just questioning ideas, questioning conclusions, questioning things that you uh, that you should that you should question versus hopping to conclusion too soon, even identifying assumptions and working to bust, bust those assumptions. That's the difference between skepticism and cynicism. So be sure you put on your skepticism lens today and not your cynicism lens today. Actually, I'm going to wear these because these are these don't pick up on the green screen as much, but uh, so that you, we can engage in um, putting up, using our armor for, our good thinking armor for uh, not being susceptible, not being fooled by deep fakes, or at least um, preventing us from being fooled too easily by deep fakes. All right, Manish, hi. We are crowded by lots of sounds with visual stuff. Yes, absolutely. Vinay, hi Vinay from India. We've got Swati. And we have got Juan from Colombia, You, everyone all around the world. This is great because we do need good thinking soldiers. We need good thinkers all around the world to help spread the message of how we can all uh, not succumb to deep fakes and all use good thinking tools. All right. So Manish says we are we are crowded by a lot of sounds, those same with visual stuff, but somehow visuals create a different deeper in impact. Absolutely. And the thing about deep fakes is deep fakes actually can incorporate sound and visual imagery. So the two put together can be very powerful. And the machines learn on us. So the more we share, the more the algorithms have data 
to see what we like and they can serve us what we like and serve us the things that are likely to manipulate us in ways that we wouldn't even necessarily see. All right, so it's not that you wanna be paranoid about everything, but we don't want to be manipulated. So what do we do? Do we have to do this with every video we see, every image or every sound that we, a sound bite that we hear? No. Do we, but should you check these things, kind of check your good thinking, put it through the good thinking grinder if you're before you post something on social media? Yes. Or before you engage in an argument and potentially use deep fake content to support your argument? Yes. Or before you make a decision based on evidence that may or may not be reliable? Yes. You need to know what you can do to minimize your chances of being misled and manipulated by machine learning algorithms. So we talked about the first condition, reflective skepticism. There's one other condition. Does anyone know what it is? It's the two conditions required for critical thinking. Reflective skepticism and the ability to change your mind. Seems super easy, but think about it. What was the last important thing that you changed your mind about in the face of reliable, valid evidence? It's hard to remember because we're so entrenched in what we believe. And that particular inability to change our mind is exactly what these machine learning algorithms are counting on. I'm gonna say hi to a couple people. Let's see who else is here, if I can do it from my phone. Hi, Pam from Texas. Fantastic, if I don't say hi to you, it is not because I don't want to acknowledge you. It's because the technology is a little clunky when you're streaming. I am streaming here on LinkedIn Live, where we are here every day, every day, every Monday, most Mondays, 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm here in the Pacific Northwest of the US, 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Also, we are streaming live on YouTube. So my YouTube channel, Becky Saltzman, and if you subscribe and smash that button, you'll get a notification that way as well. So there's two ways that we're doing this and hopefully we can grow the world, uh, the, grow the tribe of good thinkers because we're gonna need it. And here we go. All right, here are some tangible things that you can do, some kind of tangible things that when you see media, you can kind of run it through a little bit of a grinder. This is not so much on the how to think, but these are things that you can look out for to see that might be, might, might be clues that you're dealing with a deep fake. There might be face discolorations. And if I got fancy, when I eventually get fancier with this live streaming, I'm gonna, pull, I tried to do this, but it's kind of clunky. I was, I'm gonna pull in some video to show you. But the thing about that LinkedIn learning course that I recommended on um, the impact of deep fakes is uh, they have a lot of really good examples. I really recommend the course. There, so you might have facial, facial discolorations and you might have lighting. That, that, that is not quite right. Um, you might also have badly synced sound. So you might see a slight, tiny, ever so, if, if you have perfect pitch or you're an audio engineer, you might hear it a little bit better than the rest of us who have just regular, regular old ears, but you might hear a sync difference. Now that also could be just a, a sign of poor editing, but it is a clue that you might not wanna share it so quickly. Or blurriness where the, uh, the neck and the hair. So one of the things is, you know, where this part and this part match, there could be some blurriness because the algorithms haven't learned that level of crispness. So that can be, that can be a sign. There can be a lack of blinking. Now, originally, early on, even like a year ago, you could detect a, a deep fake sometimes because you would see a real lack of blinking. Maybe it would just be like this, like this, like this, and then a blink like this instead of just regular natural blinking. A lot of the algorithms have caught up with that. There is also a jerkiness sometimes. You will see a, a jerkiness and it's almost that uncanny valley where you can't tell if this is a real person or a fake person. And then there might be inconsistencies in skin tone that you wouldn't see as normal inconsistencies in skin tone that, us, that we humans have. So those are some things, those are about seven things that you can look out for to help you determine or help you kind of take a step back and say, wait a minute. Now, are you going to be able to determine with absolute certainty that it's a deep fake? No, 
But if that deep fake video is asking you to do something, asking you to share it, asking you to transfer money, telling you you're fired, asking you to come in, come for a date or come in for a job interview, that may be where you want your reflective skepticism to kind of tune in to some of these potential uh, deep fake, um, deep fake content. All right. The kind of questions that you ask might be a factor to identify between skepticism and cynicism. Manish, that's another good point. I, I would bring that comment in because I, I wanna highlight Manish's comment. That is really a good point. And we're gonna get to some of those questions in a minute. All right. Now, it is only a matter of time. We've got technology that is chasing these deep fakes. And let me also say that deep fakes aren't all bad. There, is, there are beneficial deep fakes. Imagine deep fakes that can take as someone who's lost their ability to speak. I know Stephen Hawkins, uh, Hawkins uh, famously uh, rejected the opportunity to create his voice in what they would think would be his voice from before he lost his ability to speak because he was identified with that synthetic speaking. That was him. That was his that was his persona, that was who he felt he was. So he rejected that technology. But for someone who lost their ability to speak, this could be this could be an incredible thing. Also think about animators, think about people or even filmmakers, not animators, but more filmmakers who need to redo a scene and may need to not, not to, to bring the entire cast or bring a particular actor to a, you know, an expensive location, they could, just deep fake them into the video. So you can see that there could be an entertainment. It could be funny. You know, we might want to be entertained by something or parodied. So there's, there is some, there's a lot actually of beneficial use for deep fake, which means that there is going to be, uh, you know, an incentive for tech companies to create better and better deep fake technology. It's not all nefarious. But that also means that this cat and mouse game of chasing the deep fakers, you know, creating bots that are social media personas, and then you follow them because they give you the things you like to hear, or they, they believe they're like-minded and they're attractive or whatever. All of these things are forms of uh, deep fake when you hear these bots. So this is all stuff that we need to kind of be aware of. And the tools that I gave you, the seven things like the lack of blinking, that's already kind of been corrected. And now they're working on blood flow analysis. There are some labs that I read about, maybe at University of Texas, I'm not sure, where they're looking at blood flow anal that analysis so they can actually maybe even look at the veins and see if there's realistic blood flow. Analysis. The level of sophistication is going to be incredible. All right, I'm gonna say hi to a couple more people. Let's see, okay, of course I'm not getting the, uh, oh, I wanna say hi to Swati. And uh, let's see, we've got Pam, we've got Manish, we've got Swati, we've got Juan, we've got Steven, we've got Raj. Anyway, if you are here, if you say something in the chat, I can see you. If you just put like a thumbs up or, you know, thumbs down, I don't know, do we have thumbs down? But if we put a thumbs up, I won't see you probably until later. And I want you to participate. All right, so when the stakes are really high, meaning even the stakes as high as I'm gonna share this on social media. What are some things that you can do? Well, the first thing you can do, the easy thing that you can do is you can, you know, you can look on snopes.com or factcheck.org or PolitiFact and see if the media has been identified as fake. So that's an easy thing. So these are some of the sites that you can pull in the media and see if the media has already been identified as fake. But what about if it's personal to you? I mean, it's your personal banker or your spouse or partner sending you a message over the phone. That's where you kind of get to this point where there's a certain level of paranoia where you're just like, oh, I can't even deal. So I would, I would say let's start with the, the most important things like the sharing, like the making decisions, um, likes making the decision to wire money. I mean, those kinds of things are the things where the reflective skepticism is really going to come in handy. All right. When the stakes are high, there are when they're really high, there are tools. These are the tools that are chasing the deep fakes, like find a, uh, it's find exif. So it's F I N D E X I F and exif viewer. And what you do, what, what these these services do is they view, this is kind of high level, maybe enterprise stuff, where they view the metadata of an image 
and it can give you information about the time and date it was captured, the GPS coordinates, and details about the camera that was used. Now, this metadata can be manipulated and removed, but it's normally a more accurate way of determining contextual details. So there are these technologies, but it's like when you play tennis and you want to get better. You want to play with better and better players. So the people that are detect or the, the technology and the technologists that are detecting, try to detect the deep fakes, it's like a cat and mouse chase game. All right. Now, if you believe a politician is corrupt, you're going to be more likely to believe a deep fake that supports that belief. And if you've shared a lot of information on your social profiles about what you believe, then there is going to be a lot of data for those AI algorithms to know you and to feed you things accordingly. And that really is the simple, 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 ye old confirmation bias, the most common cognitive bias in the in our toolbox of biases that make us believe evidence that supports our pre-existing beliefs and discard evidence that does not. Now, when you talk about validity of evidence, you're talking about something that is that, that is bias-free or is that valid in that I've pulled out assumptions and check for biases. Those are the those are the kinds of those are the kinds of things you want to tease out. If you're dissecting something for validity, you're looking at assumptions and you're looking at uh, biases. So what is it valid is the first critical thinking question. And you see that that's not a cynicism question. That's a critical thinking question. So in addition to uh, confirmation bias, there are other biases to look out for. I mean, a lot of them, but these are some kind of basic ones. And that's where you can run it through the cognitive bias grinder a little bit and uh, see if it comes out safe and valid from the standpoint of, from that question of critical thinking validity. All right, the affect heuristic. The affect heuristic is when we allow feelings of like and dislike to make us believe something is true or not true. So a, a perfect example is I like Starbucks coffee, therefore I should invest in Starbucks the company. That's an affect heuristic, allowing feelings of like and dislike, or I like this candidate, I'm gonna hire this candidate versus this candidate is qualified and all of these other, um, all of these other criteria are met. So, or I don't like this candidate um, personally, but this candidate, candidate is very qualified, so I'm not gonna hire this candidate. That is the affect heuristic. So if you have someone that shares some, something and you like that person, and Facebook knows that you like that person because you've liked a lot of their content and you're friends with them and you're a super friend with them according to the algorithms, then you're going to be more likely to believe the content that they share. And if the algorithms know, then there can be manipulated, they even know what you like, the, the algorithms know that what you like, content can be manipulated to trigger your feelings of like and dislike in a way to make you believe the content more strategically. All right, second one is clustering illusion. And this gets down to the old correlation is not, not causation, meaning just because things happen around the same time or around the same place does not mean that one caused the other. And the thing that I always remind myself is Wednesday did not cause Thursday. Wednesday came before Thursday, but it didn't cause Thursday. And when we refute, when we when we confuse correlation and causation, sometimes fakes will be positioned strategically uh, before or after a real video to give us this illusion of something happening when it may or may not be happening. So just being aware of the clustering illusion, just being aware of how our emotional feelings of like and dislike affect whether we're going to believe uh, the fakes is really helpful. And the last one to look out for is the anchoring or framing effect. And this is such a powerful effect because we know that certain words like smash or massacre or annihilate trigger emotion in ways that if if they if it coincides with what we're likely to believe, we're more likely to believe it. So this is how titles of deep fakes can get us to click on deep fakes and the algorithms learn what we're clicking on so they can deliver more 
accurate content to kind of hit us in our in our good thinking region and uh, jeopardize our good thinking. So this um, anchoring effect, you might see um, a real video that has been way vetted or maybe even something that you saw in person and you shared it on social media. And now that video is being kind of shown with a deep fake video or even sandwich in between two real videos to make the, the peanut butter and jelly part of the sandwich, which is the deep fake part, uh, more digestible because it's, it's covered with bread that you know is uh, real. So this is how you can anchor and frame or how content can be anchored and framed to trick you. All right, so you quickly and mentally run the videos and photos through the ringer of these cognitive biases. And that's a really good first step because these biases are sneaky. And frankly, they don't just apply to deep fakes. So pro tip is you can use some of the, the, the cognitive bias ringer to run a lot of things through. But when it's deep fake, the stakes are high. All right, I'm going to say hi to Erwin. This is a good topic for the tech, technological lifestyle that is embedded in our day-to-day -day lives, 100%. And if you think that these particular things are not going to get uh, better, these deep fakes are not going to get better, it's called machine learning. And those of you who are here who are committed to lifelong learning, you know that machine learning algorithms are kind of by default committed to lifelong learning. So cheers to lifelong learners, cheers to you. All right, now we're going to come to the second uh, critical thinking question that has to do with reliability. So first we talked about validity and the difference between validity and reliability is validity is really dealing primarily with, with biases and assumptions, whereas reliability is, can we count on it? Is it replicatable? Can we count on it? Is it true? Is it a fact versus a value claim? Things like that. Now, of course, validity and reliability overlap, but it's nice to kind of tease these things out so that you make sure you're not forgetting anything. All right, because usually the deep fake is used to persuade us or convince us of something. I mean, why go through all that trouble of creating something if not to convince people of something or persuade people of, to, um, persuade people to do something or manipulate us into doing something? All right, so the first question is, is the source credible? Now, does the source line up with my beliefs is not the same as is the source credible. So if I believe all this stuff and I know that this is the place that I go to hear what I want to hear, that it's not the same as asking, is the source credible at all? All right, so you can next ask who captured this photo? Who captured this video? Is the person who captured this content the same person who uploaded this content? And is that the same person who shared the content? And the farther and farther away you get from the original source, the more likely it is that the original source is outside of what you can see and understand, and you should pause before sharing or pause before allowing that to influence your decision. All right. Now, if so, you know, what can I tell, if, if I know who the source is, I've identified the source and I think, hmm, I don't know if they're a reliable source, but I've identified the source. Now, if, if you have, then you can ask yourself, what can I tell from their previous social media post or previous media content? And does this seem, normal to me? Does this, does this jibe with what they've done in the past? Now, this is assuming that the original source isn't a bot to begin with. But if your friend took a video and posted it and uh, shared it and you wanted to confirm, did you really take this or were you, did you, were you there but you, someone else took it and you shared it from this event? Those are kind of things that you can start to think, I'm not going to share my friend's video because it really wasn't my friend's video. Now you can see, did they share other content that was similar from a similar time and place? And that's not a sh for sure. That won't lock you into knowing something is real or not a deep fake. But these are some questions that you can start to think about. And frankly, you can share less 
We can literally share less. And if that means that you're not sure if something's deep fake or not, before you share it, you don't need to share it. So you should probably confirm whether it's deep fake. So you can also find out when something is created, like when was the photo taken? And this happens all the time. I mean, how many times have you seen on social media where someone has shared some video of something really emotional, like a fight or something that has happened? And then you think, wait a minute, I remember seeing that a few years ago. And they're attributing it to something or they're, they're, they're attributing it to something that's happening now, but they're using old footage that has nothing to do with the topic. Now, there are some tricks. Google is a perfect, oh, my ear, my ear thing is falling out. Google is a perfect little tool where you can literally do some fact che checking about when this video was created or when this photo was created. So you go to Google and you click on images and then you drag your image into the search bar and you can click on the camera icon. And that will show you some data of uh, where the image was used. So you might say, oh wow, I was about to share this video in 2020 and this I see that this was first used in a completely different country, in a completely different context in 2005. So then you might pause and say, I'm not gonna share that video. Or you can right click on an image and go to, there's a time drop down uh, search tool and you can see when and where the image was used that way. So if an image of some fight, you can see that it was originally used in you know 10 years ago. And you, know, you can even check a time range. So you can even put in a time range saying, hey, was this video shown or show me all the times that this video was shown between this time and that time. So there's a lot that you can do simply checking on Google before you share. And if it's that important that you share, it's that important that you make sure that you're sharing and perpetuating good, true, reliable information. Now you can go crazy by comparing an image with Google Street, like you could go to Google Street and see, wait a minute, if that image was taken there, that doesn't match up with Google Street. Now that's getting next level. But when you're going to use an image to for a sales pitch or training or something where you're going to be persuading or influencing people, you better be sure that what you're presenting is not fake. So, or is not, um, in this case, it would just be, you're not presenting fake news because you're not using an image that you're attributing to one thing and it really didn't come from there at all. All right, so those are some quick tips and tricks. And then the, the, there's a final kind of question that you can ask yourself, which is, is there a second reliable source that is also sharing this evidence? Now, this gets into checking the reliability of the, of the person uh, sharing the information or the organization sharing the information. And again, that reliability can't be determined by whether you, whether this organization feeds you things that you believe in. It has to do with whether this organization is a valid organization, a reliable organization. And they make mistakes too. We've seen it. You know, we want to say, oh, all media is fake news and this is new. And we've had yellow journalism and fake news since the inception. But that doesn't mean that you're cynical about fake news because, or about the media rather. Because if you're cynical, then where are you going to get your news? It's only going to be things that you see and you perceive. And if that's the case, you're going to leave yourself very susceptible to deep fakes. So the key is to have reflective skepticism, apply these questions, and remain open to changing your mind. So again, any questions? Again, I'm not seeing the uh, all the, the scrolls of the comments, but if you have... I thank you all for being here, Manish and Pam and Erwin and Steven and anyone else that I didn't get to see, Raj, anyone else on the show, on the on the live stream. If you have questions or comments afterwards, I'm gonna try to hit them all um, later. So if you're watching this live, great. If you're watching this later, great. YouTube is a good way to get your comments in there. If, you're, if you follow me on uh, YouTube, my channel, Becky Saltzman, or on LinkedIn, you can subscribe on YouTube easier. You can smash that button. But if you follow on LinkedIn, this should pop up at 9 a.m. Pacific time on Mondays or 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And I'm going to give you, before we say goodbye today, I'm going to give you the situations where you really should be applying good thinking 
to identify, you know, shallow fakes too. Don't get fooled by shallow fakes, but deep fakes are going to get very, very, very smart, smarter and more and more difficult to, to detect. So these are the conditions where I'll leave you with these are the conditions where you want to be aware that deep fakes are out there and to apply some good thinking. Is it reliable and is it valid? Questions with a few little tips and trick tools brought in. And there may be more tools that will help us later determine deep fakes, but those will also be chased by the deep fakes. So it'll be this cat and mouse game. But here are the situations where you really want to pause using your reflective skepticism and remaining open to changing your mind. And here are the scenarios when you're formulating ideas about what and who to believe. When you're using the content to make a decision, particularly when you're making a high stakes decision, personally, professionally, with high stakes decisions, you need to pause and make sure that the evidence you're using isn't a deep fake. When you're using it to persuade others, now it might be tempting to just say, well, as long as I can persuade others, I don't care whether this is fake or not. But what you do is you're telling the algorithms this is that, that, that you're willing to do this. So be careful what you share because if you're using that, and it's not really fair to be using deep fakes when you know, when, you, when you're a good thinker, it's not fair to use deep fakes to persuade others. It's not ethical. It's not right. So, and also when you're including it in your own created content. So if you're doing a presentation or you're teaching a class or you're presenting to a company or you're doing a sales pitch or anything that you're doing, make sure that the content that you're using isn't a deep fake unless you're using it to teach people to detect deep fakes. And when you're just, 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 just sharing on social media, that's the other time where hmm, ideally you should be pausing and considering with a little bit of reflective skepticism, is it valid? Is it reliable? You know, is this my confirmation bias? Do I just feel good about the person? Should I reshare this? I really like this person. That's my affect heuristic. Well, all of these things happened at the same time I saw these other things in the news, clustering illusion or anchoring, provocative words like crush and massacre and annihilate in the title that makes me click to see, wow, what is this stuff? Ooh, this is really bad or this is really good. Detection technology will chase it, will chase the deep fake technology and deep fake technology will outrun the detection technology. The key is, to be aware that what we perceive is never all that there is. And to use our good thinking as a lens for interacting with that reality. So thank you for being here. I wish I could see more of your scrolling questions in real time, but I promise, I promise, I promise to get to them. And if you're watching this later, please share because we need I actually try to share this video if you can share it on YouTube, whatever. And it's not because, you know, there's some personal thing. It's because we all need to be aware of what's coming, what's here. And the last thing we want to do is find out our friend just transferred their entire life savings um, to an uh, offshore account unknowingly because some video told of their friend or their financial advisor told them to do so. So anyway, that's what we're dealing with. And next week, we've got some really cool things. So tune in next week, next Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time on YouTube and on LinkedIn Live. Have a great week. Don't be fooled by deep fakes.